and we'll let people join as they can. For now, let's go ahead and, and get started. My name is David Murphy, Marketing Programs Manager with Baywa RE, and we're excited to host this webinar featuring Mike Mahan, Technical Trainer with SMA America. If you currently do commercial installs or curious about commercial jobs, this is going to be a super informative webinar for you. Uh, before we dive in, though, as always, just cover a quick housekeeping items. Uh, we've scheduled 90 minutes, a lot of material to cover in this webinar, and that includes time for Q&A. Speaking of questions, we absolutely encourage questions. Please go ahead and enter questions as you have them using the Q&A or questions window of your screen there, and we're going to save those for the end of the material and answer them all at once. You'll also see a chat feature in your window. We won't be using on that. We'll be focusing on the Q&A uh, feature, so use that for any questions that you have. Um, yes, the webinar is being recorded, and you'll receive a link to the recording once we've wrapped up. That said, the Q&A at the end is, always has a lot of really good content, so you'll want to stick around today to get that. Uh, presenting today is Mike Mahan. He's a technical, trainers, technical training specialist with SMA Solar Academy, delivering in-person training and webinars covering SMA products and the basics of PV. Prior to joining SMA back in 2011, Mike taught NABCEP entry-level exam preparation and PV installation and design classes for private firms and also to members of the Los Angeles Conservation Corps. Mike studied chemical and electrical engineering and has worked in the energy industry since 1998. We also have Aaron Bingham, product manager with Baywa RE, as well to help with questions um, as needed. So with that, Mike, I'll turn things over to you. Awesome. Well, thank you, David. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, everybody online for joining us. Um, as was mentioned, there is quite a bit of material in this presentation. I will go through these slides fairly quickly, um, and we will catch up on questions at the end. So please jot down anything uh, that may be unclear as we go through these slides, um, but we do want to cover uh, quite a bit. Uh, my name is Mike Mahan. Uh, you can reach me at the training at sma-america.com for any follow-up if we don't get to uh, an answer for your questions at the Q&A period. But we do have quite a bit of material. I want to start with our TriPower Core 1 device. We have just launched two new power classes for this family. And I want to focus a lot of time on this family. This is our 1000 volt DC commercial string inverter. We will close the presentation with an intro discussion of the new high power Peak 3. Uh, and I want to be very clear that is a modular solution for really large scale, and I kind of say utility, but that is a 1500 volt string inverter. And it is designed to work really at 1500 volts, not 1000 volts. So I do want to make a, a good comparison and contrast between those two. Before we leave with the core one, though, I do want to spend a little bit of time talking about everybody's favorite topic, code and utility compliance, and how easy it is to comply uh, with all of these ever-changing requirements with the core one family, and spend a little bit of time in section three on SMA's data manager, that is the EDMM abbreviation, and the new Sunny portal powered by NXOS that supports the data manager. So that it would be a replacement, if you're familiar with it, for our cluster controller. Like I said, I want to close with some information about the high power peak three and provide a little bit of comparison and contrast to the core one. So let's dive right into the discussion of the core one. We launched this as a 50 kilowatt unit uh, in 2017, and we have just recently introduced two new power classes. Uh, we have also updated the 50 kilowatt unit, and we'll talk about what we added to the models that end with the dash 41 designation. Uh, there's a couple new built in features to them that's uh, pretty exciting. So even the 50 kilowatt unit has been updated. We wanted to expand the power class to a little higher power, and the 33 kilowatt unit is a little smaller power class for smaller projects, but also for repowering of existing PV installations where the array is running at 600 volts. Uh, many of those have been out in the field for a good number of years. There may still be a lucrative PPA associated with those plants, uh, but the inverters either need to be replaced or you can get more, uh, in essence, more money with a newer, higher efficiency inverter for those systems. The Core 1 family, all of the models look like the device here shown to the right. 
There you are listed to 1,000 volts. Uh, the smaller unit I mentioned really can work at 600 volts, but the two bigger power classes really are meant to, to be running uh, with 1,000 volt arrays. The DC input window for all of these devices is very, very wide. Uh, each of the individual MPPT channels needs to see 188 volts DC to start making power, but after that they are programmed to know that the array voltage will sag as the heat of the day increases, so they will work down to 150. So you have a very, very wide operating window for each of those inputs. Lots of flexibility for uh, very different string lengths to be able to fill the roof with PV. Each unit has six independent maximum power point tracking channels with two strings providing power to each. Uh, you can see the 12 string inputs directly on the unit here. Um, be aware that SMA provides in the accessories bag with each unit the mating connectors, including the ferrules to cramp on the wire for all of these. So these are Amphenol UTX connectors, but if you don't commonly use those, that's not a problem. <laughs> We're providing you with the makeup connectors and the ferrules to clamp onto your home run wires to attach to these inputs. The Having the six different inputs to the device provides really ultimate flexibility in terms of having uh, the ability to have multiple different string lengths and orientations coming into these channels, along with that very wide uh, DC operating window. But most installs will not utilize six different string lengths coming into each unit. Uh, one of the other benefits of having these independent tracking channels with only two strings coming into each is the fact that you do not need fusing on the inputs because they are not being paralleled before the MPPT trackers. So there are no series fuses to install on commissioning to worry about during maintenance or operations uh, PM cycles. The DC disconnect that you see a little bit to the right here uh, is uh, included. So you don't need an external DC disconnect for this unit. On the US models, on the opposite side, there is also an AC disconnect built into the device. So we're trying to design into this unit everything that would be required for a commercial rooftop installation without requiring any other components be attached or mounted next to and wired up to the inverter. We're trying to include everything all in one box and simplify installation and speed of installation and maintenance without removing this series fusing. On the AC side, these devices tie into a 277-480Y service. The terminals inside on the AC uh, for this inverter are certified for copper or aluminum conductors. So it's the first string inverter from SMA where the AC terminals were certified for aluminum conductors as well. In the inverter, we have a very wide DC operating uh, voltage window. The maximum power point tracking algorithm in the inverter has an add-on feature that we call OptiTrack Global Peak. That provides the ability to do a sweep of the whole voltage operating window. So if there are conditions of partial shade on the array, that can introduce humps in the power versus voltage curve that can fool a very simple algorithm. But providing that sweep ensures that this device can operate its array, even in conditions of partial shade, at the optimal operating point, even without any module level power electronics. So the sweep function plus the very wide operating voltage window allows us to provide lots of shade mitigation but without any module level power electronics. So again, being able to fill the commercial rooftop all accessible space with PV modules, even if you're getting close to a stairwell entrance or HVAC equipment or something else that might be a shade object uh, in winter time in the early morning or late afternoon hours uh, that is not a concern. The inverter will work to ensure that that shade impact is minimized. The new models, the Dash 41 that I mentioned before, uh, so all three power classes in the new Dash 41 uh, 50 kilowatt unit have a built-in transmitter that sends a SunSpec certified rapid shutdown, in essence heartbeat signal, on the DC conductors out to the array. And a SunSpec certified receiver, such as the TS4-R-F module level power electronics units, will be able to listen for that signal. If it's present, they will allow the module they're attached to to work normally, contribute to voltage and current on the string. And if that signal is not present, those devices will isolate their modules and go into a rapid shutdown mode. So you're capable of meeting all of the requirements 
of the 2017 NEC 690.12 using the pairing of the Dash 41 models and these TS4 Dash R Dash F uh, SunSpec certified receivers out at the array. So again, trying to remove, and we'll show visually other ways to comply that require a couple extra hardware pieces. Uh, so aiming to simplify code compliance, reduce cost, have the transmitter built into the inverter, uh, and requiring very simple electronics uh, out in the array uh, to achieve all this code compliance. In the inverter, you can see above the DC disconnect, there are three LEDs on the side of the unit for very basic um, monitoring of status. You just want to see the green LED on. Uh, there is no graphical display on this device. Uh, what the inverter has are um, multiple methods of communication. There are two Ethernet jacks in the communications board that is under this DC lid uh, for wired communications, and that's what we would recommend for long-term monitoring via the Sunny portal. But also for commissioning or for on-site maintenance, the inverter has a self-hosted Wi-Fi network. So if it has DC or AC power, the inverter is capable of broadcasting a Wi-Fi network. Any device that can join a Wi-Fi network and run a web browser, then will have access to the graphical user interface of the device. And we assume that nowadays people have in their pocket a much better display than anything we can build into this inverter and expect it to last 20 years in the sun. So having access to that very nice graphical user interface is, is a real benefit, uh, especially for commissioning to make sure that everything the inverter is reporting on the DC inputs and on the AC side uh, looks good. And we'll talk about in the code compliance section, the ability to push a parameter file to these inverters and set all of their operating parameters all at once by pushing that file. So certain jurisdictions in the US like California or Hawaii or the Northeast of the United States where there are certain smart inverter functionalities that are required to be enabled. It's very simple. You simply push that file that you've downloaded off of our website to the inverter during commissioning via that user interface and you can attain compliance with those utility requirements. There's some a little more forward-looking features built into these devices. Uh, the ability to provide reactive power day or night is included in these devices, which is pretty interesting. And we will talk about the two larger units. They have uh, what we call reactive power headroom. So the active power limits for the devices would be 50 or 62.5 kilowatts. But those two units have the ability to achieve this maximum active power rating while still providing reactive power. So certain areas, utilities may be requiring uh, operation of the device away from a power factor of one. That means that the current they're producing will be slightly out of phase with the utility provided voltage waveform. It is possible for these units to work at a power factor of 0.95, either leading or lagging, and still achieve this nameplate active power rating. So there's no loss of money making capability. So uh, that is another, uh, I think, I don't know how many people are taking advantage of that right now, but definitely a very nice forward looking uh, functionality. Each core one device ships with commercial rooftop feet that can be attached to the device. Again, all of the mating connectors, including ferrules for the uh, 12 string inputs on the DC side and caps for any unused inputs, moving handles, and each unit out of the box, when you lift the top off the box, it's on its own pallet and you have access to the bottom of the device immediately. So you can either attach those commercial rooftop feet or if a different type of mounting structure is to be used, if this is for a ground mount, um, but it is to be elevated off of the ground or if it is for a carport and you want to attach it to the stanchion well off of the ground, you have access to these threaded screw holes that are on the bottom of the device immediately upon unpacking. So you can attach whatever mounting um, hardware is appropriate uh, and then attach the moving handles. There are two holes on each side, lift this device into its final location uh, and then wire it up. If you are using the mounted, I mean, the threaded screw holes for mounting other than the included commercial rooftop feet. Uh, ensure that you don't drive that hardware in more than 14 millimeters. I don't know how well this is documented in our, in our uh, user manuals and installation manuals, uh, but you actually can pop out and we'll show you the wiring areas in here. You can pop out into those wiring areas and compromise uh, the bottom of the, uh, 
uh, inverter and we don't want to do that. So if you are using your own hardware, uh, there is a thread depth <laughs> that you should pay attention to. Uh, otherwise, it's very simple. Uh, each inverter is very easy to, uh, to stage and place. So again, no racking structure needs to be built for this. Uh, no DC or AC disconnects need to be attached or wired up to them. Uh, we're aiming for very simple installation. A little closer view on the DC side, uh, we're arranging in columns of negative and positive. So there's two negatives, two positives for each input. But be aware that you actually can fully drive each maximum PowerPoint tracking channel through a single positive and negative input. So if you want to use a Y branch connector at the array to combine two strings and bring only one positive and negative back to each input, that is completely doable. Just remember to cap the unused positive and negative. The mating connectors and the ferrules that we include in the accessories bag are for wire sizes uh, AWG 10 or 12. So if you're gonna do that Y branch connector and you go to a larger uh, wire size, you certainly can get connectors that will work for that larger wire size um, from Amphenol, but what we're providing uh, just to be aware is for the 10 or 12 gauge. So again, visually just kind of showing that Y branch connector out at the array, bringing back a single positive and negative to the inverter. And again, you have six tracking channels here. So uh, you have the ability to have different string lengths <laughs> coming into all of those. And again, depending on the install location temperature range uh, and the module type you're using, uh, the range of modules will be uh, dependent on that. But you have a very, very wide range for really any install location in the US that you can think of. Um, so the DC side is pretty straightforward. Now we're looking at the AC wiring side. So with the AC side, lid removed. You can see the shaft of the AC disconnect right here. Uh, you have the three line connectors, line conductors, pardon me, and the neutral wire where they would land. The core one does need to tie into a 277-480 grounded Y service, but the neutral is used as a sensing electrode only. If your AHJ does not require the neutral to be run to each and every inverter, you can leave this pre-installed jumper in, and we're connecting the neutral to the equipment ground for the inverter body. If, so that could be a wire savings. If your AHJ does require the neutral to be run to each and every inverter, definitely remove this, uh, but we're hopefully can allow you to uh, reduce the wiring costs on the AC side uh, using that jumper. Uh, above the AC disconnect, shaft, you can see there is built into the inverter, both on the AC side and also on the DC side, these SPD holders. So the holders are built into the inverter from the factory, and we have accessories kit. If you look at the price list from Baywa, you will see SPD kits for the AC side and the DC side of the core one. And there actually now are two variants, either type two or a combination type one and two for the AC side or the DC side. So that SPD protection is not provided unless you get the accessories kit and install the SPD bricks. And that is all that is in the accessories kit is just the SPD bricks for uh, the four on the AC side or the nine on the DC side. Uh, but the holders are there built into the inverter ready to accept those bricks. A quick view of some people who have uh, done an installation that might be slightly different than just the commercial rooftop uh, using our included feet uh, for a ground mount. Sometimes there are requirements to lift the inverter above uh, floodplain levels. So driving another um, a pile for the, that would support the array and having a mounting uh, structure for the core one is certainly a very common occurrence. Uh, SMA cells are universal mounting system that is really kind of a wall mount unit for the core one. Uh, so that's another possibility. And some people in carport situations have created uh, a very nice uh, stanchion attachment support for the core one uh, that we very much like because this one you can see the, the thermal core of the inverter is up of the center. So there are some heat sink fins that go into the center chimney of the inverter and the the thermal core allows for passive cooling, and then there are three speed control fans and a tray at the bottom uh, that can turn on if the inverter warms up and force air over those heat sink fans. So we love that there's good airflow path here up through uh, the device. In terms of design, uh, the machines are rated to 1,000 volts DC, so that obviously is the voltage limit for any of the inputs. Uh, there is a current, a short circuit current limit for each of the inputs. It's 30 amps ISC, and that's for each of the six inputs. Be aware that in operation, the inverter is going to pull a maximum of 20 amps or 120 amps total for the device from each of these six channels, but the hardware limits uh, for the 
inverters are 1,000 volts DC and 30 amps ISC. If you're respecting these limits, we allow you to design up to a 1.5 DC to AC ratio. So you can see for the 50 kilowatt unit, a 75 kilowatt STC rated array would be our maximum. And this does scale for the other two power sizes, even though I don't have them on this chart. So lots of flexibility uh, for uh, design range. <laughs> this uh, production graph is probably not common, uh, but we want to show this as evidence of uh, the engineering design for the core one as well as uh, thermal performance. Uh, this was this uh, production graph was created with a 50 kilowatt unit that was attached to a 69 kilowatt PV array, but that was also on a single axis tracker. So Davis, California is close to our headquarters in Rockland. It is Central Valley, California. Uh, this was in July. It got pretty warm um, that day up to about 112. And the core one, it's not actively shaded. It is by some equipment that will provide a little bit of shade, but there will be times when it was out in the sun. So it was probably running a little warmer than this. Uh, definitely the fans were probably on, maybe at maximum speed. But the last stage of thermal protection for the core one, if the internal temperature continues to rise and the fans are on full blast, the last thing the inverter can do to protect itself thermally is simply to produce less internal heat by generating less power. So if that had happened, that derating, you would see this power graph just go down linearly. So the inverter was working for more than nine hours at full blast. You see the 50 kilowatt unit. So the array was capable of sending more than 50,000 watts to the inverter. So it's moving safely moving the array off of that maximum power point and extracting 50,000 watts plus whatever to overcome its conversion efficiency to output 50,000 AC watts for more than nine hours during the day of a very warm day. So the Inverter is designed, even if it's very hot air that is being forced over those heat sink fans, let it breathe and it will do what it needs to to thermally self-protect. So while this is not a common <laughs> production curve, I don't think, uh, it is very interesting to see and a very good uh, demonstration of the design effort that has gone into uh, this machine. I don't want to spend much time at all on this data sheet. We're showing the three different power classes for the core one. Uh, what I do want to emphasize is, again, this smaller power class is capable of working very well down to lower DC voltages that would be common uh, if you were considering using this with an array that was strung to 600 volts. The two larger power classes, generally to get maximum power out of them, uh, are most suited for 1,000 volt arrays. Uh, but this device for smaller projects or repowering existing 600 volt arrays uh, is, is very, very nice design. On the AC current out, you can see that these devices are sized with the maximum AC current that works out to a very nice overcurrent protective device size, 50 amps, 80 amps, and 100 amps respectively. So if you are, uh, certainly for the larger two power classes, if you are building up to larger scale system, 80 amp breakers or 100 amp breakers would fill up very nice standard AC panel collection sizes, uh, 800 amp or 1000 amp panel. You would fill those fully with standard breaker sizes without wasting any capacity. And so uh, 10 of these devices or eight of these devices to get a half a megawatt system, again, collection on the AC side is very standard equipment. These are designed to scale up to much larger systems of very easily uh, with standard equipment and not uh, really sacrifice anything on the design side. The two power classes, again, the active power is lower than the apparent power limit. And what that provides is, like I said, and we're looking at the 50,000 watt unit now, where if you look at active power and reactive power graph, the apparent power circle is generally the limit for an inverter. And as soon as you move away from the power factor of one, where the output current is perfectly in sync with the utility provided voltage waveform, you generally start sacrificing active power capability, but not for the two bigger power classes of the core one. That 50K unit, again, 50,000 watts is the maximum active power. So it will not go above the green line, but that means you can provide reactive power up to power factor 0.95 and a little more leading or lagging without sacrificing any of that active power, the money-making capability of the device. So very, very useful either for upcoming utility requirements 
or if these are installed on a site where providing reactive power uh, would avoid utility build charges. And again, I'm not going to talk about it, but there is the queue at night feature for these devices. They actually can provide reactive power day and night. So if it is to mitigate uh, equipment on site that has certain reactive power needs, the inverters are actually capable of doing that day and night. The SunSpec rapid shutdown transmitter that I mentioned before, we'll talk about in a little more detail, but again, that is built into the circuit boards of just the Dash 41 models of the TriPower Core 1. But the circuitry in these devices has also been updated. The AFCI requirement that has been in code since 2011, that used to just be an outline of investigation. It got formally promoted to a full authorized standard recently. Uh, and devices eventually will have to be listed to the new standard. What that included was really just more real world reproducible testing um, scenarios to ensure that really false positives and false negatives were uh, reduced so that anything that actually passes the standard testing uh, would be a better and more reliable device out in the real world. Um, all of the core ones, including the original uh, 50 kilowatt unit and our residential line of inverters have all passed the uh, standard. So again, uh, just most current safety requirements. And also, again, the AFCI circuitry is listening for high frequency noise on the DC lines. And we are now adding a device that is sending on the DC lines a communication signal for this SunSpec rapid shutdown. Having that integrated in the same device allows for those two functionalities to work harmoniously and not uh, interfere with each other. So again, uh, higher reliability and security and also then having the benefit of this reduced cost compliance uh, with code requirements. So uh, a lot of engineering going into that as well. I had mentioned the self-hosted Wi-Fi of the core ones, again, with DC or AC power, the inverter is capable of providing uh, a Wi-Fi network. The name of the network will be SMA, followed by the 10-digit serial number of the individual device. The password for that Wi-Fi network to join it will be SMA12345 for 10 operating hours or until commissioning is complete. So we want to provide installers with something that's easy to use and easy to remember. Uh, this is not device specific and so is not secure after 10 hours or the first commissioning, this password goes away and the password becomes a 16 digit device specific, very secure WPA2 PSK password uh, that can be read off of the label on the device. So that becomes a secure <laughs> password, uh, but that is much harder to type in on a little device keypad, uh, but is much more secure. Once that Wi-Fi network has been joined, simply opening a web browser on this device, putting in a specific IP address will take you to the login screen for the user interface of the device. So a very nice, well-designed graphical user interface uh, instead of trying to put a display here on the front of the device. The communications board of the inverter has two Ethernet jacks built in, again, for uh, really more reliable long-term monitoring. I would certainly recommend the wired uh, connection. And if you have multiple inverters, obviously, you can daisy chain those on the roof, bring them down to a uh, site router. Any computer on the same local area network can access the inverters. Again, each inverter will be assigned an IP address from the router. Simply putting that IP address in a web browser address bar and clicking enter will take you to the login screen of the user interface of that particular inverter. It's the same user interface that you can access via the Wi-Fi, so the same look and feel. You can register one, two, three, or four uh, of these devices as a single plant on our Sunny portal without needing any uh, data logger from SMA. So you can put small plants on the portal without needing to buy a data logger. Uh, and then that can be visualized anywhere you have uh, access to the internet, either through the uh, smart apps so on iOS or Android app or on computer. Uh, generally for systems of more than two inverters, I would recommend the data manager, but again, it's possible to have that monitoring uh, be available even without the data manager. The cluster controller, which we will have as the, the uh, device that the data manager is replacing, had the ability to have um, 
environmental sensors wired directly to it. So that's generally of interest to a commercial system operator, but wiring those sensors directly to the cluster controller is not really, it didn't make sense all of the time. Um, there is a sensor module accessory card that SMA sells that plugs right into the communications board of the inverter. So the sensor module does need third-party sensors to be wired to it, but if you install the sensor module card and wire uh, one or two temperature sensors at a radiance uh, meter, you can do wind speed as well, uh, that information then is available in the communications channel of the inverter uh, without requiring the data manager uh, standalone weather station. So for some systems, this is a very nice add-on. Um, the sensors that we know that work with this sensor module card, we have a compatibility document uh, for those devices. But again, temperature, uh, irradiance, uh, some important information, uh, environmental information for commercial system operators uh, can be made available right in the communications channel of the inverter. We'll talk about the data manager a little more in depth later, but that's the sensor module I just mentioned. The mounting system, again, this is kind of the wall mount bracket for the core one and those AC and DC side SPD kits. So this is kind of the list of accessories for the uh, core one family, and we'll talk about the data manager uh, after the, the utility requirement segment. So again, everybody's favorite topic, uh, code and utility requirements. Um, I want to go over a little bit about rapid shutdown. So NEC 690.12, both are uh, essentially uh, legacy uh, TLUS TriPower family and the new Core 1 families can meet all of the requirements of the 2017 NEC 690.12, including the inside the array a requirement that just went into enforcement uh, January 1 of this year uh, by using the TS4 and these components, the gateway and the CCA would be in, and its power supply would be included in the outdoor CCA kit uh, that you could get from Baywa. So the Cloud Connect Advance can talk to one or more gateways via a wired connection. The gateways talk via essentially a wireless signal to these TS4 devices. And for full compliance with the 2017 code requirements, you would require one of these devices per module. So the TS4R-S or dash O, the dash S device is in essence providing module level data off of the module it's attached to and listening for a shutdown signal to be sent from the gateway. So it's not doing anything electrically to the output of its module. It's simply providing data off or listening for the shutdown signal. The dash O variant of the TS4 family has that shutdown functionality, has the ability to send module level data off of its module. And in addition, it has the ability to mitigate shade or mismatch. If the module it's attached to cannot provide the current from the that the inverter is asking the string to produce for whatever reason, shade or intentional mismatch, then the TS4O will jump into action. It will take power from its module. It will push voltage down to boost output current up to mitigate that effect and not bring down the string uh, to this level of current, but will provide that unshaded current level. So it provides some ability to adjust the output of its module. It's not doing module level maximum power point tracking. It's primarily in standby mode unless its module is incapable of working at the string current that the inverter is asking. So one of these devices per module communicates to the gateway. The gateway is gathering all of that data and providing it to the, the Cloud Connect Advanced. And that has a DC power supply. The gateways uh, with the updated uh, mesh functionality can manage up to 300 modules, which works out to a fairly large array with standard uh, commercial sized modules. Uh, the Cloud Connect Advanced can handle 900 total modules via multiple gateways. Uh, so that's a very, very large arrays. But a, and to achieve compliance with the 2017 code requirements, as long as whatever device uh, it, that is designated as the rapid shutdown initiator removes AC power from the inverters and from the CCA, the system will go down into rapid shutdown, will meet all of the requirements of code, including the inside the array requirements. Um, so all uh, of the requirements of 2017 690.12 can be met uh, with a configuration like this. This would work with any of our TriPower TLUSs and any of our core ones. Uh, and this mesh functionality is very nice. It allows for uh, if there is a 
uh, object, say an HVAC unit between the TS4 unit and the gateway, it will allow other TS4 units to act as repeaters to be able to send that signal uh, around the obstruction. So it allows for uh, far fewer gateways to be needed uh, for the installation. And so there are some requirements on maximum distance uh, from the furthest TS4 to the gateway uh, and some distance requirements between the devices that may be acting as repeaters, but it gives quite a bit of flexibility uh, to design the system uh, with a minimum number of gateways on the roof. So again, if you had some device that would prevent direct communication between one of those TS4 units and the gateway, it allows another TS4 to act as a repeater. So uh, filling up uh, the, the roof with a minimum number of gateways, uh, but still uh, achieving all of the 2017 code requirements. Again, that does require uh, the TS4 units and a few gateways in the CCA. The new models of the Core 1, the Dash 41, have that Rapid SunSpec certified transmitter built into them. So in conjunction with the TS4-R-F, a SunSpec certified receiver that would be at each module, the transmitter, when the system is in operation, is sending that Keep Alive signal on the DC conductors to these receivers. These devices are not doing anything to the electrical output of their modules. They're not sending any module level data off. They're simply listening for that heartbeat signal. As soon as the system AC power is removed from the device, the device is capable of sending, you know, a, in essence, it will take away that keep alive signal and all of the TS4-R-F units will cause their modules to go into shutdown. So without an extra communications channel using the built-in transmitter uh, and the receivers at the modules, you can achieve all of the requirements for the 2017 uh, NEC 690.12. So again, that's only for the Dash 41 models, but again, you have no extra communications channel that is needed here uh, to uh, achieve compliance. So all of that signaling is done along the existing DC uh, conductors. Okay, so for switching gears a little bit from uh, code compliance to uh, utility requirement satisfaction, we're looking at the login or the home screen of the user interface uh, for a Core 150. Uh, it is possible to go into the user interface at commissioning and push that parameter file to the inverter and set all of its operating parameters by simply giving it that file. So whatever the requirements may be, if it's the California Rule 21 requirements, if it's the ISO NE, if it's for Hawaii, uh, we even have re very recently posted uh, a, a configuration file for Puerto Rico, the prepper requirements. Uh, you simply download that file off of SMA's website. And when you log into the user interface the first time, the inverter realizes it hasn't been commissioned yet. It asks you how you wish to commission it. One of the options is adopt configuration from a file. So you simply click on this tile, you load the parameter file, it ends in .bck, to the inverter. And again, these files are on SMA's website right now. If you go to sma-america.com, go to the products, go to the core one page, on the download section, there's a tab called Programming and Configuration. So all of these different files are contained in a zip folder with some instructions. You simply download this folder, extract the contents. You have that .bck file. If the installer goes to site with a, I would recommend strongly a laptop, something that can navigate the file system, you open the user interface, click on this tile, and direct the user interface to the correct BCK file and load it onto the inverter. And you're in compliance with uh, those requirements. California Rule 21, there was an update on February 22nd uh, <laughs> to adjust the requirements. It used to, there was phase one requirements that went into effect in September of 2017. Uh, those have been updated. There are some new requirements that went into effect uh, for projects permitted after February 22. Uh, both the phase one and what I'll call the phase three or the updated requirements are on the website. So depending on which requirements you might need to meet, uh, both of those files are available. And again, HECO, ISO, NE, and now also some PREPA requirements. So there's multiple files there. So a, a lot of work has gone into the user interface of the inverters and making it easy for installers who use SMA equipment to be good 
uh, participants, good players in the utility world uh, so that we can work with the ever-changing utility requirements but not make it a big time sink or huge effort to achieve that compliance for your installers. Um, we want to make it easy, uh, but we want to uh, represent the industry well. Okay, enough about code, more fun stuff. The data manager and the new Sunny portal. Um, if you are familiar with the cluster controller, um, that was the monitoring and control device for commercial systems from SMA. The data manager is in essence the replacement device for that. Uh, there are a few important differences that I would like to emphasize. The cluster controller could manage up to 75 devices and that was really just inverters. The data manager can manage up to 50 devices and that includes inverters and external meters or IO devices. So the Elcor watts on meter is the approved energy meter for the data manager in the US. And there are a couple of uh, IO accessories from uh, Moxa and Wago that will allow environmental sensors to be attached to those devices. And the inverters and the meters and IO devices that the data manager is going to uh, work with simply need to be on the same local area network segment. With the cluster controller, there were dedicated speed wire ports so that the inverters needed to be brought to those ports on the cluster controller. Sometimes that was a bit of a um, restriction or required a little bit of extra wiring. So again, the data manager doesn't require these devices to be wired directly to it, simply to be on the same local area network. And having the meters not need to be wired up to uh, the device directly uh, as they would have been with the cluster controller, again, provides a lot of freedom and ability to uh, locate things in a more rational manner. So the data manager can manage up to 50 devices uh, and anything that it's going to access, you tell it during commissioning what it's going to be working with, they simply need to be on the same local area network as the data manager. So a lot of flexibility in terms of having maybe on a single rooftop, you're daisy chaining uh, via the communications board with ethernet cable, the inverters on one roof, uh, but there may be another roof or another structure. Uh, those can be brought to uh, different network pieces on the same local area network and the data manager can still see them and still control them. The user interface of the data manager and the new visualization in the Sunny Portal powered by NXOS look very much uh, the same. Really the only difference you can tell we're looking at the new Sunny Portal because the logo is up here in the top left. Uh, they, you would see the SMA logo and the data manager name if you were looking at the user interface of the data manager. Um, but a general overview like you might see in uh, the classic Sunny Portal, kind of a speedometer view of power, some historical data on energy and power, status of the plant and the devices, some information about CO2 avoidance and feed-in tariff, but a, a little bit updated. And there are some other features that are available in the new NXOS Sunny Portal um, right out of the box that are, I think, beneficial time savings for commercial system owners. One of the, the icons on the left side is the Analysis Pro tab. You can look at the plant in terms of the whole plant or individual uh, devices. So what we have is three Core 1 inverters attached to a data manager. When you click on the Analysis Pro tab, you have different tiles available to you immediately. So you can see AC power, uh, DC power, we have uh, reactive and apparent power, voltage and current on the AC side, voltage and current on the DC side. If there are environmental sensors, you may have a radiance, you may have temperature. Uh, a lot of this is available uh, and the tiles will be highlighted if they are reporting uh, appropriate values. The nice thing about this view is that it used to be if the Sunny Portal wasn't recording specific values, you could set up a custom graph and then the Sunny Portal would begin to monitor those values and provide the graphical view, but only back to the point that graph was created. All of the values for these tiles are available for the whole history of the plant from the date it was created on the Sunny Portal. So this is all accessible and there is a very nice level of customization uh, available, especially for the core ones on these analysis pro graphs. 
So I may want to look at uh, the whole plant, but I want to dive down into a specific inverter. So now we have the plant, but I've specified a single core one. And now I'm interested in looking at the DC power. So I have the AC power tile clicked. So we'll see AC power for the plant, but I also want to look at the core one. When I click on this tile, there are six inputs to the core one. I can select all of them as I have here. So they're all um, uh, activated, or you could look at individual channels. So I can dial down to the input level of each of these inverters. So there's possibly two strings. It's not really string level monitoring, but it's very detailed monitoring uh, available here on these inputs. And the graph adds these curves. So the graph below will add these curves after I select the tiles. So I still have the AC power for the whole plant. I have the AC power for the core one, and I'm moving this bar, this slider bar, so you get a status of the time I'm viewing, and not just the AC power for the inverter and the plant, but now all six DC powers. So one, two, three, four, five, six DC channels. So I'm seeing the DC power for those as well. So they're all being essentially grouped here and shown in a numerical value. So possibly these three inputs were strung similarly and these three inputs were strung similarly. That all looks good. Uh, if they were all strung the same way, this would be an immediate uh, you know, place to look for something going on, some shade object, something, who knows what, uh, but very, uh, I think, very easy and intuitive uh, monitoring and very quick troubleshooting simply by clicking on the tiles, not having to worry about creating the custom graphs uh, as you used to. If you're looking at values that have different units, uh, as you select those tiles, we're looking at temperature now, uh, different axes with the different units will appear and you can have uh, more than just two. So as you're moving the slider now, we're seeing temperature values displayed alongside power values. So you'll see those graphs uh, superimposed with the appropriate axes for each. One thing, and this is not very uh, intuitive graph, but I do want to highlight this. We had a customer that came to us and said, well, I, I'm, I'm putting in some core one models, but there are two existing non-SMA inverters uh, still on this plant, and I would love to monitor them. Uh, I know you can use an energy meter. Uh, can I use multiple energy meters and use those to actually monitor the output of the non-SMA inverters rather than power flows at the point of interconnection? Uh, and the nice answer was, yes, that is actually possible. So you can see Elcor meter one and Elcor meter two here. So as kind of a dummy test, we simply attach two meters uh, to report uh, via the data manager to the portal. So it's possible for this customer then to get the appropriate CTs for the power meter, attach those to the output leads for the two non-SMA inverters, and they will actually be able to see through the meter readings, the output of the non-SMA inverters and the SMA inverters on one display page. So consolidated graphical view, very, very nice. A couple service concepts before we switch gears uh, into the High Power Peak 3. Uh, the Core 1 family uh, is uh, launched the commercial Smart Connected program for SMA. What that is is a free offering from SMA. All that it requires is registration with our commercial inverters through the data manager to the NXOS Sunny portal. Then you simply opt into this program. What that means is now SMA service will be monitoring this plant behind the scenes. Anytime it's reporting errors or warnings, SMA service will proactively see those, can notify whoever you designated as the point contact uh, via email uh, to you know, follow up with troubleshooting. Or if it's an error code that SMA service knows oftentimes results in an RMA uh, or uh, work on the inverter, they can proactively trigger an RMA to be shipped to the address that was selected during registration and an automated email will be sent to the responsible party saying, okay, well, we've seen this error. Uh, generally, this will be an RMA swap out. We're sending you that device to the address you designated. Please contact the system owner for a convenient time to perform the maintenance. So instead of having an installer have to go to site, diagnose on the phone with SMA service, uh, the issue, trigger an RMA, go back to their shop to wait for the unit to come to them, to go back to the site to do the swap out. Uh, we're aiming to make the service support for these plants be far more efficient and more a positive proactive uh, uh, experience for everyone involved. Also, uh, the Core One family has launched now the first uh, uh, time in SMA's history where non-SMA personnel could actually do board swaps on our units in the field. Uh, there is some training that needs to happen, a couple video watching uh, episodes uh, to understand how these boards are swapped out. 
but there is now the possibility of, of doing a board swap out versus a whole unit RMA for some issues. Um, so again, just uh, going through the training uh, to allow that field work to be done, um, but it is a very nice setup. The, uh, the core one is set to do uh, uh, some field work rather than doing a full unit RMA. So I think a very, very nice um, set of uh, service supports that are being launched with this product. Okay. Well, let's switch gears now. We'll talk about the High Power Peak 3 for a few minutes. Uh, this device, I don't know exactly what the status is for this device. My understanding is that we were slightly ahead of our April 1 um, quote unquote delivery date. So I don't know if that means that uh, orders are being accepted and POs will be taken now, but uh, we are definitely on track for the timely launch of this product um, at or before the start of next month. So uh, an exciting device. This is our first 1500 volt rated string inverter, a very, very compact unit, only 216 pounds for either 125 kilowatts or 150 kilowatts. The form factor is the same for either unit. The difference is the AC voltage that they output at. The 125 kilowatt unit outputs at 480 volt three phase. The 150 kilowatt unit outputs at 600 volt three phase. Each of the units has a single maximum power point tracker. Again, this is designed to be a modular unit to achieve large scale PV plant power, but with a centralized uh, design. Uh, so each unit will have a large monolithic array. Uh, there will be a combiner box out at the array for their array segments, uh, but a centralized location of these easy to service, easy to work with, easy to move uh, units uh, provides a lot of benefit uh, for using a centralized architecture for a large scale PV plant, but with modular units. Uh, I do want to emphasize when you look at either of these units, so the 705 is for the 125 kilowatt unit and the 880 volts is for the 150 kilowatt unit. Uh, these are the low ends and the 1450 is the high end for the rated MPT window to achieve that CEC efficiency. Um, and, and there's a slight lower window for operation, but not much. So these are truly designed to be 1500 volt devices. So really not meant for 1000 volt arrays. So really not appropriate for a commercial rooftop, but a very, very power dense, compact unit. And again, the design uh, recommendation for large plants would be to have your DC combiners out at the array with single positive and negative home runs coming back to each of these units, but to have these units centrally located uh, near the transformer station on an inverter skid uh, where the AC runs that will be at lower voltage than the DC runs will be short and all of the communications wiring between these devices uh, to be very short as well. So to give that a little better visualization, you know, much longer strings with the 1500 volt architecture, uh, higher voltage DC, these would preferably be the, the longer runs. Uh, so a less voltage loss, I mean, a less power loss there with the higher uh, voltage. The stationing of all of these devices in a centralized location would reduce the length of the, sh the lower voltage uh, AC runs and also reduce the uh, complexity of needing uh, communications wiring to be out in the array field, have that all be consolidated as well. So the benefits of the much higher uh, DC voltage, but taking also the benefits of the centralized architecture, even though these are modular, smaller power units than say an SMA central inverter. You get the benefits of uh, the modular architecture, but the centralized location with the much higher uh, DC voltage. So again, really these devices are meant to run with 1500 volt arrays for you know large scale ground mount utility scale systems, uh, really not meant to be um, for commercial rooftop to take the place of just a couple core ones. And again, just visually to show the shorter AC runs and the communication runs uh, near the uh, transformer pad. Uh, but the nice thing is, again, the 125 kilowatt unit is outputting at 480 volt uh, three phase directly. Um, so possibly if this were a large scale uh, ground mount near a commercial site, uh, could just tie into the commercial service. Or again, with a very large scale, multi megawatt scale, uh, maybe the 600 volt units, and then you're tying into a transformer with 600 volt three phase on the uh, low voltage side up to uh, medium voltage on, on the high side. 
and the nice thing too is again with those DC runs, you you have the much larger, uh, much higher, pardon me, uh, DC voltage for the longer runs, and then also the ability to possibly come over overcome some of the line losses uh, using the higher DC to AC ratio. So any power loss, uh, really you can size up the array slightly larger to overcome that loss. Whereas losses on the AC side, if you're using long AC runs, there's really no way to overcome that. So those are truly sunk losses. But now with AC being the lower voltage, minimizing those run lengths and also minimizing uh, the length of the communication hardware uh, simplifies uh, service and maintenance quite a bit. Okay, and again, just to emphasize um, the transformers that these guys work with be standard distribution transformers, nothing really special, uh, pretty common uh, AC voltages. And the wiring for these devices, again, they need to see uh, the grounded Y service, but there is no neutral terminal on these devices. So the neutral is not run to these devices. Um, and so then the high voltage side could be Y grounded or Delta. And again, we have our transformer requirement document that goes into much more detail than this uh, posted on our website. Okay, well, I have talked for quite a while. <laughs> I would love to give everybody some time to ask questions. I do want to um, make everyone aware that we have some uh, installation manuals uh, posted, again, all on our website. These are accessible for you to download immediately. Uh, we have tech tip videos uh, that we have recorded. If you go to sma-america.com, if you scroll to the bottom, if you click on the YouTube icon, you'll be taken to our channel directly. Or if you go to YouTube and just search for SMA America, you can see these videos. Uh, we definitely have some recorded webinars. Uh, we don't have one for the High Power Peak 3 yet, but very soon we'll be uh, talking about that quite a bit. So we have stuff for the Core 1 and the Data Manager M. And with that, I have come to a close. I would love to open the floor for questions. Mike, thank you. A lot of really good information. And yeah, we'll give you a second to grab a drink of water <laughs> there. Thank you. Um, as a reminder, a lot of good questions have already come in. If you haven't asked your question, but hanging on to it, go ahead and ask it using the questions feature uh, there. And we're going to go ahead and dive into um, as they came in right from the beginning. Um, first question was going back to the MPPT. Uh, question is, what is the best methodology for distributing strings across those MPPT channels? And then second part, is there value in plugging one string into each MPP channel pair and then plugging remaining strings into channel one, two, three, et cetera? Um, so in terms of distribution across the MPPTs, I don't know if there is um, uh, recommended guidance. They certainly can be loaded unequally and one could be left completely empty. So I think it's more of sizing the inverter and if you have really just using those optimally to fill the commercial roof uh, with PV as, as uh, any accessible space and use that up. Um, the second part of the question, I'm not sure that I understood uh, was something about pairing uh, strings into the inputs and then having some inputs not paired. Was that? Yeah, and Sam, chime in if, if I missed your question here, but going back to... Um, Where'd that go now? Um, he says he <laughs> installed a handful of these and always uh -huh. wondered if there was a best practice for how the strings are distributed across the various channels. Um, no, I don't know that there is a best practice. If you're getting down into the real nitty gritty, um, I do believe that for the core ones, the optimal DC voltage is roughly around 700, maybe 720. So having longer strings into those into certain input channels, even if you would then not utilize uh, a remaining input channel, might eke you out some more power. Um, if you have some PV modules that would be close to a large shade object, you might want to have a string that is um, fairly long but is incorporating as much of the shade as possible into it uh, to allow that string to uh, essentially that input to bear the brunt of the shade impacts. There are some tweaks I would say that could get you probably, you know, fractions of a percentage point of energy gain, but uh, you are definitely uh, sharpening to a very, very fine point at, at that level. <laughs> Otherwise, you're pretty free to fill the uh, uh, fill the inputs as you see fit. 
Got it. Got it. Okay. And um, along those same lines, I believe um, question was, so this has a 12 string MPPT, correct? Uh, no. So it's six independent MPPTs with two strings per. So each one is handled independently, can have different operating DC voltages. So the two strings coming into each input should be the same orientation and the same length, but each of the six can be different. And let me Got, okay, okay. back way yes, back here a bit, but I'll pull up this slide uh, to show and swap these. That, you know, we're showing, and again, this depends on the module type and the temperature range, but 12, 15, 14, 13, 11, 16, you know, those inputs are all independent. So the operating DC voltage will be different for all of these, and that's fine. Got it. And also, um, I know Aaron has been busy answering some of these questions on his own directly to uh, the individuals, but I'm going to go ahead and ask him just for the benefit of the group sure. as well. Um, moving on, if inverter is Y, how would we be able to remove the neutral? So the inverter is only using the neutral as a sensing electrode. It's not, it's contributing balance current on the three line conductors. It, it does need to have that to be attached to a grounded Y service, but it's not putting any current on the neutral by itself, if that makes sense. So it needs to have the neutral be associated with the ground as it would in a grounded Y. So that's why the jumper will work. Um, but it does not contribute any current, so it does not need that conductor to go from the inverter back to the transformer. So hopefully I understood the question right. <laughs> but that, you know, the, the jumper will work. The inverter will see at the neutral terminal a reference to ground. It's not trying to put any sort of current out on that terminal. So that's all it needs is just the kind of the ground reference there. So hopefully that makes sense. Okay, well, let me, let me kind of stick with, with that theme then. Um, there we go. An application question, the inverters yes. provided, provide balanced production on all three phases at 277 uh, slash 480Y. Mm -hmm. Are you aware of any phase imbalance in aggregated power from multiple inverters after a step-down um, experiment? Um, so that brings up a good point. If the, for whatever reason, um, you know, load, if these are tying into the AC panel to service before you're getting to the utility transformer, obviously those load panels could be unbalanced and that might adjust the voltage of the lines so that they might not be the same. Again, the inverter is exporting balanced current, which means that it might not be exporting balanced power. So they, it, it, as long as those voltages are within range, it's going to export current onto them. So there is certainly the possibility that there would be slightly different voltages on those conductors, if that makes sense. And I don't know if that answers the question. Um, yeah, Neil, let us know if not, and we'll come back to that. <laughs> um, moving on to mounting, though. Okay. Do you have, or does SMA have, that you know of, Mike, any pictures of all the different ways that they can mount the TP Core 1 inverters? Uh, this person's under the assumption that these are only concrete mountable inverters. Uh, no, um, certainly not. So hopefully this picture uh, makes it a little more clear. Uh, we include four uh, EPDM commercial rooftop feet with each device uh, for the ability to be freestanding. Um, obviously, say out in California, there would likely be seismic requirements that would require the inverters to uh, be anchored uh, somehow, uh, and that's certainly possible to have a roof penetration uh, that can then be leashed or tethered or attached via a rigid device to one of the threaded screw holes in the uh, you know, body, but otherwise they may be able to use for maximum support the four commercial roof feet. But then you can see certainly for ground mount, you may have to raise these up off of just a concrete pad to be over the elevation of the floodplain. Um, so again, you have access to those threaded screw holes in the bottom body, bottom of the body of the inverter to attach whatever mounting structure uh, is reasonable. Um, the, the one thing that would be a requirement is I believe you have up to a three degree tilt on this orientation, but otherwise vertical. Uh, so other than that, and that's outlined in the manual, uh, you have but definitely flexibility in terms of what this mounting bracket uh, and the mounting um, height <laughs> would be. 
Yeah, definitely. Okay, great. Um, changing gears a bit to yeah. revenue grade metering. The ah, uh, question okay. is, is, it, is there a way using Data Manager, Sunny Portal, to do revenue, revenue grade metering or agency reporting, or does that require a third party uh, metering solution? Um, so so um, the third party metering solution is obviously an option. Uh, having the Elcor meter, uh, there are, I believe, revenue grade variants of this. And again, it also depends on the CTs that you would be using. So if the Elcor meter was used and you had the revenue grade meter CTs on the output of the PV system, I do believe you would be able to comply uh, and provide that data. Um, I would probably refer uh, whoever's asking this question to our applications engineering group to get a more definitive answer and also maybe some options for a uh, third party monitoring uh, if they wanted to go that way. Uh, but yes, I do believe you, you could do it. Again, there would be some uh, requirements on the meter and the CTs to make sure they're hitting whatever level of uh, uh, accuracy would be required, but I do believe you could do it, yes. Yep, okay. And a bit ago, you were talking about combiner boxes. Uh, does SMA ah. make combiner boxes for peak three or is that a third party item? We, we well, what I say is we, we do. Um, I, my understanding though is all of the ones that I have been made aware of would be um, listed for IEC, perhaps not UL listed. So I, I will likely say that it might be easier to find more options through a third party. Uh, and, and again, you know, generally you're going to be looking now at 1500 volt uh, combiners. And the nice thing to understand too is with some of the changes between 2014 and 2017 code, um, these are transformerless um, inverters. The 2017 code does adjust the um, required number of fuses. Uh, 2014 code said with the transformless inverter, uh, if you're using fuses, you had to fuse the positive and negative for everything. So that was quite a few fuses. Uh, 2017 says you just need to be uniform. You either fuse all the positives or all the negatives, but you only need to fuse one pole. So that flexibility also, you might have more choices with a third party uh, provider uh, to uh, comply with whatever code cycle you're looking at at 1500 volts. Okay. Thank you. Now moving um, back to Sunny Sunny Portal, will Enix OS be replacing Sunny Portal? And if so, will all Sunny Portal sites be moved over? <laughs> that is the long-term goal, but I don't think that will be a concern for uh, several years. <laughs> so that that definitely is the, the plan, is to eventually have everything migrate uh, to the new Sunny Portal. But right now, it, it really, it, it's kind of like a almost a dual uh, roadmap. And you can see when I was looking at NXOS, there is a link, uh, either uh, portal, you'll see the link to the other portal uh, on the page. And so it's kind of a dual track right now. Um, but definitely, there is uh, the ability for, I believe, and I want to be careful on saying this, I don't have a whole lot of experience with this, but swapping out a plant with a single cluster controller with one with the data manager. And so obviously that migration and ability to uh, upgrade either through hardware or simple um, migration from the classic portal to the NXOS portal, that's definitely roadmap items, but not something that's going to be immediate future. Okay, thank you. A lot of really good questions coming in. Thank you, keep them coming. Um, and let's see if I get this one right, Nathan. Is there a combine? Is there a combiner input or combined input for the core one if we need more than twelve strings? Um. So no. But uh, like I said, for the core one, the input channels can be driven fully through a single positive and negative, as long as you are staying in compliance with. Let me get the sheet, the screen up here. The thousand volt DC and the 30 amps ISC requirements, you could potentially combine three strings and bring a single positive and negative to one of those inputs. And again, each input is going to draw no more than 20 amps in operation. So you can do the combining as long as you satisfy these hardware requirements. You don't ever go over 30 amps to any of those inputs for ISC or 1,000 volts. And again, the inverter is going to limit the current draw to 20 amps in operation. And that's per, in, per input channel. And there's no way to uh, gang those MPPTs together. 
So hopefully that answers the question. Okay, so, look, yeah, in looking down the list, I see we're gonna be doing a little jumping back and forth, so <laughs> that's sorry <fine>. about that. <laughs> no worries. But just going down um, the list here, an interesting question about rapid shutdown. Yes. Uh, question is, any issues splitting a single inverter between a roof and a ground array, ground array with regards to rapid shutdown? And this example is half the strings require rapid shutdown, half the string doesn't. So, uh, yeah, th this one's uh, uh, many answers. Like you say, I think for strict code interpretation, you could simply equip the roof mounted uh, part of the array with the shutdown, but I would generally recommend um, for um, service and uh, just any sort of emergency response uh, interpretation, potentially having uh, each inverter's array be either fully compliant with shutdown hardware or not. So associate inverters with the ground part um, that don't have it and the roof that do, simply because there might be confusion when somebody triggers the shutdown, they might assume that the modules on the ground were also in shutdown. Um, so for for strict code compliance um it probably would be acceptable to the letter of code to have the ground mount array not be equipped um but i, I would suggest for um clarity and future servicing um and exactly what was being shut down when the rapid shutdown was triggered um perhaps to have um you know each inverter with its array be fully equipped or not equipped at all. Um, okay, that's not really an answer. <laughs> that's not really an answer, but uh, <laughs> that's what I'll say. Uh, Got it. Well, JP, let, let us know if, if that didn't answer your question. But now I'm going to go back to um, an earlier question. So the, it sounds like the, um, the tag on was, so how can we input more than 12 strings for example, high efficiency modules such as the SunPower 435s um, having a max string length of 10 modules. So, um, exactly. If you have that, um, perhaps it would make sense almost to, if I'm understanding right, your shorter strings, so the smaller array overall to uh, the smaller size inverter uh, with the same high voltage. Um, if I'm understanding correctly. Um, certainly with higher power modules, if you have 12 strings, you certainly have the flexibility of going up to a 1.5 DC to AC ratio with these to have lots of uh, SDC power. Uh, so yes, if the string links, um, because of the high voltage of the modules, the string links are short enough that the STC rating of the array with 12 strings was lower, um, possibly using uh, the 33K um, unit. Uh, still running up to that high voltage, if I'm understanding the question correctly. Okay. Well, and again, um, the sun power know. modules, if you have those and they're high voltage but low current, again, the um, requirement is simply no more than 30 amps ISC. So if you have sun power modules that have, you know, like a five amp um, ISC, you could potentially parallel three or four strings in an external fused combiner bring the output positive and negative to an input of one input channel for the core one. And again, as long as you're not violating the 30 amps ISC in the worst conditions, the highest light level, whatever, um, the hardware is fine. Again, that would require an external fused combiner box outside of the core one, but these are the input requirements or limits for that. Um, so depending on the um, stringing, and again, then you might be getting up to pushing the DC to AC ratio. This certainly might be a question that we can funnel to our apps team uh, and let them look at the design. Okay. So moving on, and Neil, this may have been answered. I believe you're asking about, so how do you argue to get rid of um, the question we were talking about earlier with the AHJ, and then, yeah, so, I'm guessing that question was answered. Let me know, Neil, if not. 
Um, yeah, and generally this is probably related to the neutral, and I'll get back to that picture. Uh, again, that is a, a, really an AHJ. We can provide documentation that the neutral is only used as a, a really a sensing um, mechanism, that there is no current put out on this. So we can provide some level of technical explanation of why the neutral conductor uh, does not need to be going back to uh, the transformer, but uh, at, at the end of the day, it would be uh, the final decision of the AHJ um, whether or not they would require it. Got it. Okay. Um, moving on, can the TS4-F spec protocol be used with the TriPower 10 inverters with an external transmitter? Um, no. <laughs> We, and that, that's simply a, a, an SMA sort of thing. We have not tested it, and we would not have that as an approved um, uh, use. So uh, if you want to follow up with our apps team and um, beg and plead and ask for um, uh, approval, um, so it, we, yeah, strictly from the uh, <laughs> pro product management side, I would say, no, we have not tested it. It's not approved. Um, so that's, <clears throat> quote, the official SMA stance. And there you go. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay, well, moving on, uh, does the 30 amps ISC include continuous duty and cloud effect? Um, so, yes, and I don't know if this is coming back to like a 2017 uh, code requirement. And again, the, the short circuit obviously is not continuous duty. Um, the, when they were actually drawing power, um, the, the inverter is going to limit this to the, the 20 amps. So for operation, the, there is a limit. It, it's really the, what you would see um, it, worst case for irradiance, um, I, I don't know that continuous duty um, scaling factor needs to be included, but certainly, uh, it, it, you know, the periods of exceptional irradiance, the, you know, 125% uh, of, of the uh, spec sheet ISC likely would need to be included. And again, I will probably um, request that whoever's asking that question contact our apps team uh, for, you know, making sure that I'm understanding that question and not giving the wrong answer. Let them um, look at the uh, actual concern and reply in, in more detail. God. Okay. Um, now, a, a couple of these I know have been answered individually, but for the benefit of the group, a non-technical question, Mike. Uh -huh. What's the product name, going back to mounting, uh, what's the product name of the wall mount kit? Oh, uh, where do I have it? It is the UMS-US or kit dash Ten universal mounting system. So that's the part number that should show up on Baywa's price list, I believe. <laughs> okay. Oops. And I'm sorry. The the notes there. I did not update that. I apologize. That ignore this this notes section. <laughs> this would be the wall mount bracket for the core one. Perfect. Okay. Application question. The inverters yes. provide balanced production on all three phases at 277 slash 480, why? Are you aware of any phase imbalance in aggregated power from multiple inverters after a step down x -firm? Um, I, I don't believe that I am technically qualified to answer that question. <laughs> the, the answer would be no, but I don't know that I have enough experience to really even answer that. So definitely that is one I will refer to our applications engineering team. Okay. And looking through the list, Mike, I believe that's all we have now. As a reminder, any, any questions that you still have, um, go ahead and, and ask them now. We've still got a little bit of time. No, yeah, they've been very good questions. I like it. Um, here's one for you, Mike, talking yeah. about the Wi-Fi. Okay. Can, yeah. can the Wi-Fi functionality of the Core 1 be disabled? <laughs> Actually, yes, it can. So we've had some customers uh, going back a ways that were very concerned about security. So uh, that Wi-Fi can be turned off. And I do want to emphasize for direct connection, it's probably not a concern, but for our residential customers, sometimes people have asked about uh, what is supported. It's a 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi channel, not 5 gigahertz. So good to, good to note as well. But yeah, good question. And... Um... 
Oh, Rule 21, very big topic. Does a core, core one comply with the new California Rule 21 requirements that went into effect last month, February 22nd? Yes, and again, it's uh, going to be, let me get to the page, um, dependent on getting the appropriate um, file off of SMA's website. So this screenshot was when we had just the one um, California Rule 21 Phase 1 a group of um, settings. There is another uh, entry in this programming configuration page now for, I, I think it probably just says California Rule 21, February 22, because it's an addition of uh, phase three requirements and phase one. So those configuration files are available on the website. So it does require loading, uh, you know, unzipping this, having that file, loading it onto the inverter at commissioning. But once that is done, yes, uh, they are in compliance with the, the new February 22 uh, Rule 21 requirements. Got it. Okay. And now weather. Early on, you were talking about the, the heat, 112 degree heat, I think it was in yeah. Davis, California. Um, can the core one be mounted where it gets snowed on? Uh, yes, actually it can. I don't have it on any of these slides, but the rating for the device uh, was uh, uh, 4X, 3SX, and it's dual rated because there's no equivalent in the uh, uh, type 4 for uh, having uh, handles or these disconnects uh, operable when laden with ice or snow, but that's what the 3SX rating covers. So it, the uh, handles have been rated to be operable when laden with ice or snow. So yes, it is dual rated and certainly appropriate for being uh, installed in areas that might have uh, some snow uh, around them. <laughs> okay. Um, which is kind of common this year. A little too <laughs> exactly. much of it for some people. Uh, and this, I think, is more of a comment than a question from earlier on. He says, we are seeing 20 amp on the neutral side of the 208, 208 volt side. Um, I don't know if there was a question there, Neil, or, or, or not, but let's chime in if, uh, if we missed something. Yeah, I'm not sure that I understand that question if it's referencing 208 volts. That would not be... Okay, well, we'll see if there's, there's anything okay. that we're missing. The last question that I have, Mike, is regarding the firmware. The question mm -hmm. is, how do I update the inverter firmware? Well, that's actually a really, really nice question. The, um, there are multiple ways to do it. Um, the communications board of the inverter, right here, um, there is a USB slot on that. So it is possible to put the firmware update file, and those can be downloaded off of sma-america.com. You could put that firmware file on a USB and physically insert it into the comms board of the inverter. It's possible to load the file onto the inverter using the user interface, either wired or Wi-Fi connection. Or if the system is registered to Sunny Portal, you can select to have the firmware automatically updated uh, via Sunny Portal. Um, so it's possible to have that handled uh, in the background uh, remotely. Okay, okay. Well, Mike, thank you. A lot of really good information. Aaron, uh, thank you for behind the scenes answering questions as they came in. If, as a lot of times happens, you have questions as soon as you, you hang up, <laughs> yeah, um, yep. go ahead and send those to michael.mahon, and that's M-A-H-O-N, at sma-america.com. There's yep. also training at sma-america.com. And with that, um, really want to thank you all for joining. We know you're just incredibly busy, so really appreciate taking time out of your day to join us. Mike, any Thanks, comments? Thanks, everybody. No, I appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day.